Hey folks, so this is, I guess, what I'm planning for my uh, um, dozer in the Tiger 2 diorama that I'm working on. Um, so yeah, it's basically two pieces of high density styrofoam insulation foam shit that I buy at a local... Uh, DIY building supply place called Home Depot. It's a big chain in North America. Um, this stuff here is used in North America to insulate a lot of different homes here. Just the outside. They just basically stick it to the outside of the house underneath the siding. And uh, uh, I can buy it in, uh, I guess it's two by two. Uh, can't remember two feet by eight feet sheets um, it's like seven dollars Canadian a sheet and I can do half a dozen to a dozen dioramas depending on what the diorama is um, out of each sheet sometimes I can do even more it depends on what I'm doing uh, if I'm just doing buildings with it and stuff like that I can do a lot if I'm doing using them as bases like this eh, it's a little bit less because it uses up a lot of material but either way this is what I use um, Sometimes they come in packing material that I get with some kits. Uh, a friend of mine, Sebastian Schof of Dutch Modeling, he got this stuff in Europe. Uh, it's the same sort of stuff. It's a bit thicker, a different color. It's a bit denser too, um, but it's basically the same idea. I don't know where he got it from there in Europe, but if you can get it in Europe, you can get it in Europe if you can get it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you can get it there too. Um, you'd have to talk to him as to where he got it from. I can't remember. I think he got it on eBay or Amazon or something like that. Oh, he doesn't have Amazon. He's in the Netherlands. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so it's possible to get it there too. So, uh, it's a bit cheaper than that blue stuff that foam modelers tend to use. Um, I'm a member of a bunch of different foam modelers groups, Facebook groups and stuff like that. And, uh, um, they tend to go with the uh, more hobby specific crafting foam that they use. Um, it's a lot more expensive and it comes in smaller quantities and thinner sheets. Um, the only benefit that I can see is it comes in thinner sheets. Um, so uh, I don't, it's not cheap. It's not a, much of a benefit to me. It's not a benefit enough that I would buy that. Um, one of the unusual things I noticed before I talk about what I'm doing here. Uh, one of the interesting things I noticed about uh, different genres of our hobby, I'm a member of a bunch of different Facebook groups um, that are modeling related, but they're different genres, like there's foam modeling. There, I'm, a, I'm on a bunch of different railroad modeling groups. I'm on a bunch of different dollhouse crafting modeling groups, uh, foam modeling, sci-fi, um, armor, some auto groups, aircraft, um, and then I'm also a member of like some martial art groups and Yaido group, like and archery groups, hunting groups. You know, I don't hunt. Um, I'm still there's cross travel between the topics, so there's it's there's stuff I can learn from both. Um, so, and one thing I noticed that there's a specific similarity between them all, and that's there's a general knowledge base that's kind of sort of shared be amongst them, but an ignorance of that knowledge that's shared outside the group. So let's say for armor modeling, there's a lot of very specific methods and products and tools that we use within this hobby. But those very same products and stuff like that are available to be used in other elements of scale modeling, like in sci-fi or in the foam modeling groups or in auto groups, but they're completely ignorant of these tools and products. And I don't really know why. It's probably, it might be because a lot of the guys don't jump out of their, out of their genre. They, they don't build outside what they do. Um, so they're completely oblivious to the fact that, you know, the, a lot of these tools are available and they could actually maybe use them in what they do, but they don't. Uh, I, the only reason I know that is because I see a lot of guys that have obviously been doing what they do for a long time asking questions about something I want to be able to do this and I want to be able to do that but is there a product available that I could do that and there I know of lots of products because I'm a scale modeler that does dioramas 
and dioramas crosses a lot of different genres. It goes into dollhouse, it goes into rail, railroads, it goes into fall modeling, it goes into sci-fi, it goes into figures, it goes into um, woodworking, it goes into architecture, it goes into engineering. There's all kinds of different things that it delves into. And because it, it does that, I learn about all kinds of different products and stuff like that. And it gives you a broader perspective um, where a lot of folks I've noticed tend to be very narrow focused when it comes to what it is they're doing and they don't look up much. It's just something that I'd noticed. Um, and I thought, I thought it, uh, at first I thought it was unusual. I was like, why don't you know that? Why don't you? And then I realized, why wouldn't they, why would they know that? There, there's no need for them to know that. They've, it's, you know, if you didn't know that there were such a thing as a meadow and you've only ever lived in the forest, why would you ever look up? Because all you see is trees. <laughs> Until you're in a meadow, you would never have a need to look up. So the day comes and you walk into a big field and you go, <gasps> sky. <laughs> you know, it's it's quite an amazing experience. Imagine when it happens. But until you are aware of it, you're just completely oblivious to it. So it's just, it's interesting. And I thought I'd talk about it, I guess. So anyway, um, it's just something I noticed a lot. And I noticed it not just in the modeling. I noticed it in the martial arts. And I noticed it in the archery groups. And I noticed it in a bunch of other groups, too. The people tend to do that a lot. And... Uh, I guess it's true in a lot of different aspects of life, I guess. Until you look up, you don't see the sky. Um, so anyway, back to this thing, which is why I'm making this stupid video. Um, so what I'm going to do is, this is basically the scene that I'm going to do. Uh, so I got the uh, figures in the foreground, figures in the background, um, which exist outside of the realm of the photograph. The photograph. Let's bang on this some more. There you go. Uh, this is the photograph. So in the photograph, all you see is the two vehicles and nothing else. Um, I uh, was looking at this thing. A lot of guys were talking about this thing here and everything. Um, this is not a driver's hatch or a radio man's hatch. Um, it doesn't have the structures that exist on either of those hatches. Um, it's Some people suggested that's what it was. And, it's, it's none of those things. Um, this loop that's on here that some people thought might have been the, uh, the there's a, like a little wheel that exists on this hatch, right? On the, the loader's hatch here. Um, it's way too big. And this is not a grab handle. This little thing that's sticking out here is not a grab handle. Um, so uh, this plate that's here does have a, like a shelf that's on it that is similar to a hatch, which is what I think drawing myself included our attention to the fact that it might be a hatch of some kind, but it is not any of the hatches that are on this tiger. Um, so it might be, now this is a guess, two different parts that are sitting on top of each other. Um, it might be um, one of the hatches from here. It's not the radio man's hatch because I can see the radio man's hatch in the photo. It's possible that it's the driver's hatch lying here with part of the jack, like the track jack from this sitting on top of it with some other kind of assembly sitting there. It's, just a, it's a pile of junk. It, it's several different things sitting on top of each other. It's not just one thing. Um, so it's possible that's what it is. Um, so, but anyway, um, I don't know. I do know that it's not just one thing. It's not just the radio man's hatch or the driver's hatch. It isn't that the structures that are on here are not parts of those things. They, if you've ever looked at the ti Tiger II's, those two hatches, they're very simplistic. They don't have a wheel and they don't have any of those things. So um, this does, but it's obviously not that because it's right there. Um, it's not the commander's hatch uh, because the commander's hatch is a big half dome. So, and that's not obviously what that is. So, um, so yeah. A lot of different ideas, but it's not what I thought it was, that's for sure. So, um, but I know what it's not. <laughs> so, but either way, um, I'm going to make an attempt uh, using bits of styrene and stuff to mimic the shapes that I see on here without actually knowing what that is in the hopes that when I photograph the diorama, the shapes that I mimic will look like this pile of junk sitting in the foreground because it's going to go 
right about there, there, right about there. And I found a camera in my bits of garbage that I have up there, all my spare parts, and I put it in this fellow's hand, and uh, I'm going to try and, these two guys are like, they're just fucking around, and they have, a, like, they're arguing over who's going to take the picture, um, so they're like, you know, messing around with each other, and uh, so one guy's got the camera, so these are going to be the guys that actually took this camera picture, I have no idea who took the picture, and I don't even know if it was these guys, and I don't know if these guys were actually doing this when it, the picture was taken, and it doesn't matter. So, but either way, that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, so, um, these figures exist outside the realm of the photograph. Those figures also exist outside the realm of the photograph. I'm adding the figures because it adds interesting story detail. Um, I don't like building dioramas that have no figures. I don't like building standalone vehicles that have no figures. I don't like building standalone vehicles that have no dioramas or vignettes because the, I find them dull. Um, I like stories. I'm a storyteller, so uh, I like overcomplicating things. It's just the way I am. So that's why this is happening. So anyway, my plan um, with this is what I'm going to do now is what, I'm going to strip off all the vehicles and figures that you see on here. I'm going to start basically filming me shaping this piece of foam into the shape that I want uh, to mimic the topography that you see in the photograph. So it's basically a, a road. The road is basically from around the edge of, we can see where it tilts away. So it's about where this track is here and comes in this direction here. And it's somewhere around in here. It's kind of hard to tell. So that's about the road. And I've marked it out on here. Um, the and it trails off into the distance, of course, and leads into the foreground. Um, that lamppost is actually a, quite a bit further away than the lamppost that I have here. The lamppost that I have here is much closer. But I put it in there for visual interest. Um, the lamppost that I have here is probably going to be a little bit too short compared to the lamppost here, or telegraph pole, um, if you really want to call it anything. Um, now, I need to do a little bit of research. This telegraph pole has some bracing on it that I can't quite see. Uh, so I need to go and find pictures of these um, to get a full picture on what they look like. There's something going on behind the tractor that I can't quite see. Any. There's another one in the background there, and it doesn't look like it has any detail, like any extra bracing on it, so I can't tell. But that actually has some kind of bracing on it, and I can't quite see what it is. There's something going on behind the tractor that I need to look up. Um, so I'll, I'm going to do some digging on that before I get too far into this. I might need to change the angle of the road. So, but that's what I'm going to do next. Before I start working on this, I have to figure out that what I'm going to do with that lamppost. Um, so, uh, what else? Anything else? So yeah. So my plan, what you're going to see me do next, anyway, is you're going to see me shave away the material that's on the road surface on this to get the general shape. Uh, and then I'll come back and maybe talk to you for a second, and then I'll probably go into um, working on uh, building it up with the cellular clay to give it the topographic shapes that I want. And then I'll probably stop there and go on to painting the tractor, repainting the uh, Tiger. I'm not going to repaint the vehicles or figures because it's not necessary. Um, they might get re-weathered, though, so I'll clean them up a bit and then re-weather them. Um, there is some dust and pigments on there that I'm probably going to remove and then reapply them in a different way uh, so that they match the color scheme that I'm going to be going with in the diorama, which I haven't decided on yet. Um, this is supposedly April of 1945, so it's uh, spring, um, and spring comes hard and heavy in Europe, so it's not like spring here. Uh, in April here things don't look like sp spring as Europeans understand spring <laughs> it's still winter here in April so um, where I live so I have to basically do it like a time shift in my head as to what that looks like um, April in Europe is more like what um, late May early June looks like here so um, 
Yeah, so I have to reimagine this in my head. It's, it's weird. It's almost like doing a, a time zone shift when it comes to European seasons compared to what I experience here where I live. Um, so anyway, uh, that didn't make any sense. I know. Anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to start that now. Um, but first, I'm, you're not going to see me do that. I'm going to do some research on that telegraph pole and figure out what I'm going to do with it. Um, but anyway, so I'll cut here and then we'll come back with shaping the diorama. <laughs> I think I got that about where I want it to be. Um, you probably saw me in the video using a very assorted number of bits. Um, that's not because I knew what I was doing, it's because I was trying new things. Um, normally the bit when I'm grinding this stuff that I use is this brass one, um, or I use this metal one here. These are the two that uh, most commonly use, if I can get it in focus, right there. Um, yeah, so anyway, I either use these in my big Ryobi drill, or I use them in my Proxon. I don't much, if I got a big project, I don't usually use my Proxon because uh, it gets hot, uh, and I, I love my Proxon, and I don't want to burn it out, so I use it for a little while, and then I'll switch to the this. This thing here is more of a brutal thing. It doesn't, it's not as good of a tool to do what I'm doing. Um, if I'm just doing like a rough out kind of thing, I'll use the drill. But if I want more precision, I'll go with the uh, Proxon because it's, well, it's more precise. It's easier to control. Um, so, but anyway, so you saw, probably saw me switching back and forth between the two tools. Um, the switching back and forth between the two tools was on purpose, but the bits were, that was an experiment. Um, at one point I was using this sander. This has actually worked really well. It's the first time I ever used this. It's just an 80 grit. Uh, sanding brush 
Um, I've never thought to actually use this before, but it actually did the job quite well. Um, and uh, it heated up the Proxon a bit, of course, because it's a lot of material to move. Um, I was using this little tiny plastic one, but as you can tell, it burned the things right off because it's plastic, and this gets really hot when uh, you're grinding it, um, and it just melted the bits right off. Next, I have a saw, a saw wheel that I hook on that thing, and that would probably work really well, um, but it didn't occur to me to use it. So next project, I'm going to try the saw wheel and see how well that works. Um, one of the things you got to be very careful about is the dust from this is pretty nasty stuff. You don't want to breathe it in. So um, you probably saw me using this. This is the end of a shop vac that I had growing the whole, throughout the whole time. And it's sucking up the majority of the particles, so I don't inhale any of them. I'm also wearing a mask, too, so because um, I don't really like breathing that stuff in. I'm still covered in the stuff, so I have to go outside and brush myself off. Um, and I wear the mask while I'm doing that, so I don't re-breathe the stuff in. And I was trying not to breathe in when I was sitting here. So, um, but yeah, so, but anyway, um, what I was trying to do was I wanted to get the angle of the road surface correct. Um, don't know if we'll be able to see this. Now, in the picture, you see that there's a, the tiger sits at a slight angle because the, it's hit the, the dozer had cleared part of the road and made it nice and smooth so the tiger could slide off. I, I obviously couldn't clear underneath directly underneath the tiger because the tiger was sitting there, but it cleared around it and then it's, it's, it looks like it's already pushed it part of the way. Um, I can't, I can see what maybe looks like slide marks right here, but not a lot of them. And there's quite a bit of kick up here, so it looks like it probably started over here and pushed some of this material out of the way. Um, you can see where the tractors move back and forth quite a lot in the area. Its track marks are everywhere. So I can't really sell, tell how far this tractor's actually, or the tiger's actually moved. It doesn't look very far. Um, at least I can't see a lot of movement marks here. But it's difficult to tell, even in the high quality pictures that I have. It is, you can't see a whole lot of movement evidence there. Um, and even back here, there's not a lot of movement of build up or kick up here on the other side of the wheels. So it may have just started to move them. Um, I don't really know. So, but either way, um, so what I was trying to do was get this angle correct combined with the flat surface of the road and where the blade of the dozer came in contact with the wheels on the Tiger. So that's what I was trying to do with trying to get this here angled the right way and well I've taken some, well I will anyway, I'll take some pictures of it and everything. Um, and the blade right now is sitting about where I want it to be. The Tiger is sitting approximately the angle that I want it to and the dozer is sitting approximately at the angle that I want it to. So that's what I was hoping to do. Um, because I can't pose the blade uh, and angle it up like I wanted to, I had to drop the, the uh, back of the dozer down in order to get the blade up a bit. It only needed to be a couple of millimeters, and you know, and that's all I needed to do. So that's what I did. I dropped, I dug a little hole basically back behind the dozer and got it. Um, so, and I got the bank here. Um, this is actually going to be two-purposed. The bank here is going to be the hillside that. Is, exists behind the beyond the road, and it's also going to be some of the um, terrain because the dozer has pushed some of the road surface, or the side of the road, up out of the way here. So I'm going to have some of that in this area here. So I'll be doing both those at the same time. So that's it for this. Uh, now the only thing I'm going to do this now is probably give a little bit of sanding with uh, the regular just a hand sandpaper um, just to you know rough up all the surfaces like this this road surface here is a bit smooth so I'll rough that up and just uh, give it a bit more smoothing and get rid of some of the back here there's I don't know if you might be able to see it this is like glue PBA glue that's come out from underneath uh, where these two pieces were glued together I want to sand that down and get rid of it um, I don't need to because it's all going to be covered in a layer of cellulose, so it's not going to matter. Um, but I, I want to have as much of a uniform surface as possible, if that makes any sense. Um, and uh, I want to have a somewhat like a, a nice toothy grip so that the cellulose has something to hold on to. 
um, and this foam block is going to get glued to a piece of uh, plywood so it has something strong to hold on to. Um, sometimes I'll, before I even put the cellulite on, I'll glue this star, the styrofoam to a piece of plywood and then I'll put a couple of drywall screws, one in each corner in, in the foam. So while it's gluing, the drywall screws hold it down and then I put the cellulite on and everything. It keeps it from peeling back up again. Um, and the drywall screws are hidden underneath the cellulite, so you never see them anyway. So um, I do that sometimes. If I think it's going to maybe peel, this time of year, the temperatures fluctuate quite a bit and there's a lot of humidity in the air. Um, and when I do dioramas, I tend to do it then. In the winter, I don't worry about it so much during the construction because it's not going to be a problem. Um, in the long term, though, sometimes six months later, the dioramas start to bend a bit because of the changes in humidity. Um, humidity is kind of the bane of some dioramas. It depends on the material you make it on. I tend to use uh, clay quite a bit, and clay is, well, it's affected a lot by humidity, so it tends to happen. So, um, If you use, like, um, texture pastes, like the stuff from AK and stuff like that, that stuff's not affected by humidity because it's like a plastic. Um, but it's crazy expensive if you're going to do a diorama of this size and use a texture paste to do it. I would, it wouldn't even cross my mind to use something like that for this sort of thing. Uh, it's too big, it's too expensive, but so it would, I wouldn't do it. Um, I would use a texture paste on a vehicle um, or on a vignette maybe, but not on a diorama. It's too expensive. It's, um, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Anyway, um, so what I'm going to do now um, is sand this thing down, and then and I guess in the next video, um, I uh, I don't know. I might start painting the vehicles, or I might start working on the diorama. I haven't decided yet. So anyway, uh, I don't think this was too long, but anyway, that's all I got. You guys be good. Keep your stick on the ice. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.